Yes. Okay. Um, let's get started. It's uh, 11.30. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Matt Ahrens. Um, I, uh, by way of introduction, I helped to create the ZFS file system uh, back at Sun Microsystems in t starting in 2001. Um, and then uh, more recently, I helped to create the OpenZFS project, uh, and I work at Delphix. So uh, what am I here to talk to you guys about? So I'm here to talk about uh, one specific piece of ZFS, um, specifically ZFS send and receive. So this is gonna be kind of a deep dive from uh, starting with like, what is this feature? Why would you wanna use it? Down to um, how, a little bit of implementation details of, of uh, how we get some of the great features, great functionality out of it. And then um, some new, uh, some new enhancements to ZFS send and receive, uh, including uh, resumable send and receive, and how those work. Um, so definitely feel free to just, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand uh, and interrupt. I think we'll have plenty of time. Um, so what is send and receive and why, why would you use it? Um, so ZFS send, it serializes the contents of a snapshot, um, and then ZFS receive gets that serialized stream and recreates the snapshot. Um, by itself, that's uh, not super useful, but the really cool thing about send, about send and receive is that you can send the incremental changes between two snapshots. Uh, and it's really, really efficient. So uh, this is used uh, primarily for remote replication. Um, so you could use this for like, I have uh, one server, I wanna replicate the storage over to another server in case this server dies, then I have the data somewhere else. Um, it could also be used for data distribution. Like uh, I'm putting all of my content onto this server, but then I want to serve it up from a whole bunch of other servers. You could use send and receive to uh, replicate that data to all of the um, content serving servers. Uh, you can also use it for backup um, because uh, you know, we're just serializing the contents. It sends it out on standard output. Uh, you could put that into a file and then at some later point in time, uh, read that file back into ZFS receive. So there's a lot of, oh, here's an example. So uh, this shows you the commands that you would run to do this. Uh, so the first example here is showing, doing a, a full send where you're sending um, the entire contents of the snapshot. Uh, you can send it, pipe it over SSH and then receive it into this other uh, storage pool. Um, in incremental, you use this dash I flag. So here we're saying, We've already sent Monday, so send an incremental based on Monday to Tuesday. Uh, and in terms of terminology, I call this the from snap because we're sending from that snapshot and to the to snap Tuesday. So uh, there's a lot of tools that can do th similar things to this. Um, like rsync is probably one of the most well-known ones. Um, why would you use send and ZFS send and receive instead of one of those other tools. Um, I'm gonna, so the, the main reasons are performance. It performs really well. It's able to very efficiently find the blocks that were changed and without uh, uh, a lot of network communication. Um, secondly, uh, it's able to maintain the block sharing between all of your snapshots and clones. So tools like uh, rsync or other things that operate at the POSIX level, they don't know uh, that you have snapshots uh, or clones, and so they can't uh, efficient. They can't really, in any way, um, uh, maintain that block sharing uh, between snapshots and clones. With uh, ZFS send and receive, it's all baked into ZFS. It knows that you know you're explicitly sending between snapshots. So on the on the other side, you get uh, those same snapshots on the other side, and uh, you can choose how long you want to keep the snapshots on the target system. Um, and uh, they maintain all the, all the block sharing that you're already getting with ZFS on the source system. Yes. Does it know about uh, readme? Because often I run into a problem where I have a you know, gigabyte file, I read it in there, and then I RSync it, and it's like, ah, oh, crap, I need to send the whole gigabyte file. Yeah, so um, in terms of renaming files, uh, it's, it totally knows all about that. Um, and uh, you know, some tools, like rsync, there are certain modes where you can tell it, like, try and figure out if some files were renamed by going and statting all the files and checking their object numbers and, and like get, get, keeping a giant table in memory. Um, ZFS send and receive does this without any of that stuff. So it's basically like no, no overhead when you do renames. Um, uh, 
Yes. So that kind of gets that kind of goes to the next point that I wanted to mention, which is completeness. So uh, because of the layer that send and receive operates at within ZFS, um, it's able to preserve all of the ZPL state. The ZPL is a part of ZFS. That's the ZFS POSIX layer. It implements things like directories and uh, rename and uh, file ownership and special permissions and stuff like that. Um, so it preserves all that state without any special purpose code. So unlike, you know, if we add some new support for like Windows SIDS or NFS v4 style crazy ACLs uh, or special things that only uh, are accessible over when you're sharing it over SIFS uh, or SMB, then uh, all that just kind of comes along for the ride without any special purpose code inside of send and receive. Unlike if you're, you know, if you were to try to add that to, uh, you know, rsync or tar or whatever, you need to add special purpose code to know, oh, there's this new type of property that I need to get on every file and restore on every file. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking more about these detailed performance things in the next couple of slides. So uh, those are some great um, claims of how awesome ZFS send and receive is. Um, so next, I want to talk about how we get those uh, great characteristics. Um, looking at some of the design principles uh, that we used in ZFS and how, we, and how it achieves those goals. So the first one is how do we locate incremental changes? So I said that um, when you send an incremental from one snapshot to another, uh, we're able to find wh what was changed very efficiently. Um, so we do this by using a bunch of internal data structures inside of ZFS. Uh, I'll show you exactly how we do that in the next slide. Um, but this is in contrast with other utilities, <coughs> excuse me, which they kind of inherently have to take time proportional to the number of files. Um, and you know, if you have record structured files, proportional to the number of blocks within that file. Um, so even if you've only modified like two files in your file system, um, it still has to go look at every directory and find every file and check the modification time of all of those files to find those two files that, were mo that have modification times since the previous uh, rsync. Uh, and similarly, uh, if you have record structured files like you know, VMDK files, um, database files, uh, those, um, if you, you know, the modification time is basically always going to be updated. So if you don't want to resend the whole file, then you have to go look at every block and compare it with the block on the other side. And rsync has like a, a great protocol for doing that as efficiently as possible, but it's kind of inherently constrained by the information that's available to it um, through the POSIX interfaces. OK, so how does uh, ZFS look at these changes? So basically, we're going to traverse the two snap. So um, uh, just to remind of the terminology here, so we're doing an incremental. We're sending it from the from snap. So basically, we know that the other side already has this from snap Monday. And uh, we're sending the contents of Tuesday. So basically, we're sending the contents of Tuesday with respect to what they already have Monday. Yes. So what if we start to use the second form there that they don't actually have at Monday? Um, so uh, then the receive will fail. Okay. Um, it will fail early or? Yeah, it'll fail when, you, when it starts. Yeah, it'll, it'll try to locate this. Uh, matching from snap and it does that like even if you've like renamed it there could be one with the same name that matches that's called Monday but it's not actually this one it knows how to detect all that as well um, okay so um, we're going to traverse the snapshot that we're sending ignoring any blocks that were not modified since the uh, from snap was created um, but the key thing, one of the key things to note here that I'll come in later is that um, the data in the from snap is not accessed. So we don't have to look at any of that data. We just need to know when it was created. So uh, ZFS, like a lot of file systems, um, everything is represented as a tree of blocks where um, these leaf blocks uh, contain the actual data um, and the indirect blocks contain pointers to other blocks. Uh, unlike some other file systems like UFS, uh, ZFS is copy on write, which means that whenever we modify a data block, we write it to a new location on disk, and then we have to modify all the ancestor blocks to update them to point to the new uh, location of this uh, block that we modified. So because of that, um, we can store in the uh, indirect blocks the time that the block that it points to was written. 
So all these numbers here are indicating what time the block was written. So this 8 says this, this uh, block of data was written at time 8, and this block of data was written at time 4. Um, cool. So uh, when we're doing ZFS send, an incremental ZFS send, um, to look at the changes, in this case, in this example, we know that the from snap was born at time, was created at time five. So we know that the other uh, system already has all the data up to time five. So we just needed to find the data that was written pa after time five. Um, so uh, you can kind of look at the, this uh, layer of indirect blocks, and we know that, okay, these ones were all written before time five, this one was written before time five, so we only need to send these two. But uh, the cool thing about the, uh, the fact that we had to update all of those ancestors means that uh, at the very top there, the block that was born at time three, we know that that block can't reference anything that was created after time three. So there's nothing in here that could possibly be born after time three because if it was, we would have had to go up the tree and update that block pointer as well. So because of that, when we look at that topmost block, we see oh, this points to something that was born at time three, that was before the, the time five that the other side already has, so we don't even need to read any of these indirect blocks on this whole half of the tree. Um, versus this one was born at time eight, so we have to look down into it. These ones were also born after time five, so we have to read them, and then uh, we would, uh, this one was born after time five, so we'd read this and send it to the other system, and then these two blocks as well we would read and send to the other system. Uh, so this is kind of the inherent, um, this is how ZFS is finding those changes very efficiently. And obviously I've simplified it a little bit here. There's much, in practice there's many more layers of indirection and there's many more um, pointers in each block. Any questions about this? Okay, great, cool. So, um, that's great that we can find those blocks uh, without having to read all the, you know, all the metadata on disk. Um, but there's a lot of other things that go into getting good performance uh, of replication with send and receive. So, for example, if you have a storage pool with lots and lots of disks, um, we don't want to just issue one I.O. at a time, right? If we, if we came down here and we said, great, read that first block, now wait for it to be done. Read the next block, wait for that to be done. Read the next block, wait for that to be done. Read the next block, wait for that to be done. Okay, next one. Then we only be getting the, the IOPS of one drive. But if you have like 100 drives in your system, uh, you could do a lot better. So the way that we do that is um, when you run ZFS send, it creates this prefetch thread. The prefetch thread uh, traverses all the same blocks that the main thread is going to need, um, but it doesn't wait for the data blocks to be read. So like in this example, it would be reading all of these indirect blocks, but when it gets here, it would issue a prefetch for this block and then continue on without waiting for that prefetch IO to complete. And then similarly, go over here, issue prefetches for these. So because it's not waiting for the data blocks to be read, it's able to get ahead of the main thread and make sure that we have lots of IOs um, issued to disk at the same time and get the full uh, throughput of, of the sending system. Um, so the performance of this, uh, the behavior of this is controlled by this tunable uh, ZFS PD bytes max. Um, this was recently changed from uh, a number of blocks to a number of bytes. The reason that we did that is because uh, essentially uh, you, in the apps, if you had unlimited resources, you would just set this to like infinity, like go as far in advance as you want. But the thing that would limit you to, to wanting to constrain it is the amount of memory that you have. So you know, however much this is set to, we could use up to that much memory to kind of buffer um, those uh, prefetches. So does that avoid something like uh, using M buffer in the pipe then? Um, this, uh, on the sending side, this should largely eliminate the need for M buffer. It's always kind of worked like this. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to say like that I've, uh, I haven't 100% conclusively tested that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, why you might need mBuffer in the receive, but uh, not anymore with the new feature that I've implemented. Um, and just a, a quick note, this, this prefetching is separate from predictive prefetching. So predictive prefetching is like watching 
what uh, blocks the application is accessing and trying to guess at what it's going to access in the future. Like, you access block one, two, three. Oh, I think you're going to access blocks four, five, and six after that. Um, this is different than that because we know exactly what blocks the main send thread needs to read, and we're just issuing them uh, before it actually needs them. So it's like prescient prefetch where we know exactly what's going to happen. Okay, so another one of the design principles is that um, ZFS send and receive is unidirectional. We're just sending data from the sending system to the receiving system. The receiving system isn't sending back any, um, uh, you know, the sending system isn't like waiting for anything to, that affects its behavior. So uh, there's two big benefits to this. One is that it's insensitive to network latency. Um, Unlike, say, rsync, where you, know, you, need, you need to have this back and forth about, like, I have these files. What files do you have? Or you know, the, the checksums of, of my blocks are this, this, and this. What do you have? Tell me what you, you know, then I'll send you whatever you don't have. It, we know what the other system has. Um, and uh, we're going, and, and so we're just streaming it out. Because of that insensitive network latency, um, with a little asterisk there about, like, uh, if you're sending it over TCP IP, you still, like, you still need to wait for TCP, like, TCP still has to wait for ACKs from the other side, uh, but, like, as long as TCP is kind of doing its job of achieving maximum network bandwidth, uh, then, then we're good. Um, also, it allows use, allows for use uh, at, for backups, so you could, like, do the ZFS send, pipe it onto a tape, and then uh, at a later time, um, stream back from that tape into ZFS receive. Um, and the, the reason that we're able to get away with this is because uh, the CLI parameters to ZFS send totally encapsulate uh, the, everything that we need to know about what the receiver has. So the main thing is like what's the most recent common snapshot, right? When you do ZFS send dash I, you're, t you're telling it what snapshot you're sending from. And that snap, uh, basically you're saying that's the snapshot that the other side already has. So that's how we know what the other side has. Um, it also encapsulates uh, in the command line parameters, what features the receiving system supports. So there's a few uh, very new um, features uh, that affect the uh, on this or the over the wire protocol of ZFS send, um, like embedded blocks and large blocks. And you would uh, you would uh, explicitly tell the sending system that uh, you want to enable the use of those um, because the receiving system supports it. If the, the receiving system doesn't support it. You can uh, not enable those, and it'll kind of uh, gracefully fall back to the older send stream format um, automatically. Yes. So if you're piping into a, a tape from the internet, can you take also that down and communicate with central, or is it just sending to the other side and saying, I have that, and then piping to the current snapshot off the sending system? Um, so the tape doesn't really know anything. Um, the uh, Basically, you would do the appropriate sends so that you will be able to successfully receive it in the future. So um, just like if you're doing replication, you would first do a full send of some snapshot, then you do an incremental from that snapshot to the next one, then you do an incremental from that one to the third one. And as long as you stored you know, all three of those onto the tape, when you receive it, you would first receive the, the, full, the, the full stream, then the incremental from the, that to the next one, and then the in incremental from that to the third snapshot. Um, no, it doesn't, so it doesn't know any of that. Um, so when you receive, you're just basically like piping the file in. Um, so first you have to create that initial one, and then like if the tape didn't have the full, you know, if you had to change tapes, that's kind of outside of ZFS send and receive. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. All those checks happen when you are receiving. Uh, did I answer your question, or is it still unclear? Yeah, 
Yeah, so those checks wouldn't happen um, while you're doing the, until you do the receive, right? So if you're doing ZFS send pipe, SSH pipe to tape, then there's no receive there, so it can't do the checks then. It would only do the checks when you actually receive it. So obviously in that case, it's very important to make sure that you're sending the right things so that those receives will succeed uh, when you're done. Just kind of like any backup strategy, right? You gotta make sure you have the right incrementals and save the right tapes, et cetera. Uh, but you can kind of do, with send and receive, because you can send between arbitrary snapshots, it doesn't have to be from A to B, B to C, C to D. You can send from A to F. Um, just like, uh, it's kind of similar with uh, multi-level backups, where you do like a, a, a full backup, and then you do daily backups, and then you do a weekly that's from the previous week. And then you can throw away all those daily backups. You can do this, you can achieve all the same kind of stuff with send and receive. Um, okay, any other questions? Cool. So, um, next uh, design principle is th that ZFS send and receive works on top of the DMU. So, the DMU is the data management unit in ZFS. Um, it, uh, it knows about things like uh, objects, um, the sizes of objects. It doesn't know about things like uh, that there are files or like what the files owners are or directories, what things are in what directories. So it doesn't need to interpret any of the state that's stored at the ZPL or ZVOL layer. Um, and so all of these esoteric ZPL features are kind of preserved transparently. Um, I'll show you an example here. So uh, there's this utility called ZStreamDump. Uh, and you can pipe a send stream into it and it just prints, out, prints it out in like a user, uh, in user visible format. Um, so this is just showing that uh, we start the send stream with this begin record, we end it with an end record, um, and then most of the records are uh, this like write type of, of type um, write record. So the begin record tells, tells us like we're sending, I'm sending you a send stream, uh, it is, I'm sending, it's a type, it's a, it's a ZPL file system as opposed to a ZVOL. And then this to GUID and from GUID are basically uh, what we specified on the command line as the uh, from snap and the to snap. So these are like the internal uh, representations of those from snap and to snap. And then it also gives you the name. Uh, the name can be used on the receiving system to create something of the same name. Um, if we look at it in more detail with a dash V flag, uh, you can see what these records look like. So um, in, th in this example, we see object records and write records. So the object record tells us, you know, there's an object, it's, it's object number seven. Uh, the type is 20, which is uh, like a, a file. Um, and uh, it has this data in its bonus buffer. The bonus buffer is like an extra block that um, the ZPL uses to store file-specific metadata, like uh, owner and permissions and things like that. Uh, but it doesn't know anything about like how those owners and permissions and stuff are laid out. It's just like, here's a chunk of binary data. Um, and then most of the records, like I said, and, and the vast majority of the data would be in these write records. Um, so the write record just says, please write this data to object 12 at this offset, and it's gonna be eight kilobytes of data. So this, um, this would be followed by the eight kilobytes of payload that it'll write into that offset of that object. Any questions? Cool. Can mm -hmm. you actually see instead of a ZPL, is it using something like a git dump for debugging, or is that mostly just a developer tool? Um, yes, it, it is a developer tool for debugging. <laughs> um, you, I mean, uh, uh, probably end users would not have much luck using this to figure out much. Um, so, if, you know, advanced users maybe could, could debug some problems using this, but mainly this is, this is a developer tool. I'm just going to say, as a user, you just made me very happy that you showed me that. It is really cool, and it does help you to understand what the system is doing better. Oh, no, um, I, had a, I had a receive that had failed, so at least I can see how far along it got corrupted or whatever that yeah. happened. Yeah, so this is a really critical tool for development to determine like um, if there's something that can't be received, you wanna know like did, is the problem on the sending side or on the receiving side? 
And by looking at this stream and figuring out like, is this what it's supposed to be? Then you can know like, is did I not? Is does this? If this is wrong, then I sent the wrong stuff. If it's right, then the receive has some problem. Okay, so that kind of concludes um, the first section, which is about uh, overview of like how how does this thing work? Why would you use it? Next, I'm going to be talking about some um, specific. Uh, enhancements to send and receive uh, that are unique to OpenZFS and then some upcoming features uh, that are uh, in progress. So this is one of the um, earlier features that we did for uh, send and receive. It's been, been in since uh, 2012. Um, and it's a feature that allows you to uh, estimate the send stream size and then uh, monitor its progress. So previously, like you know, in, in Oracle uh, ZFS, um, you do a ZFS send. Uh, if it's an incremental ZFS send, there's really no way to know like how big is that going to be. So you come in the next morning and it's like, well, it's still going. Does that mean it's almost done, or does it still have a long ways to go? And I should cancel it and, and redo it tomorrow night. Um, now it estimates it. It tells you it's going to be, you know, 2.78 gigabytes. Um, and then uh, it monitors it, tells you each second, like this is how much we've sent so far. Um, and then uh, you can also consume this using like libzfs and libzfs core to integrate it into, uh, you know, into your application or you know whatever framework is driving this. Um, we also did a bunch of improvements to uh, the way zfs send and receive works with holy files. Um, that is uh, sparse objects that um, haven't been completely written. Uh, typically, this is like zvols and vmdk files. Um, so the two big improvements that we made are, one, uh, we're now recording on disk when those holes were created so that we know if we actually need to send the hole or not. Uh, we only need to send it if it was created since the previous snapshot, just like a, a, a non-hole block. Um, and then secondly, we improved the time that it takes to actually punch the hole um, when you're receiving it. Um, previously, it was like O of number of cached blocks, and uh, now it's constant time. Um, so that's a huge improvement. Uh, another cool thing that we added in the end of 2013 is um, bookmarks. So, uh, right. so uh, we mentioned uh, a while back that the incremental send, it's just looking at the from snaps the time that the from snap was created. It isn't actually looking at the contents of the from, from snap, but you still have to have that from snap present on the sending system. Um, so the bookmark kind of removes that requirement. Um, so you can, delete, you can create a bookmark. The bookmark remembers the uh, creation time of the snapshot, and uh, then you can delete the bookmark. Uh, sorry, then you can delete the snapshot. Yes, so the from snap can be deleted, and you use this from bookmark instead. I'll show you an example here. So this is how you might typically do uh, incremental replication workflow. So you know, each day, you take a snapshot for today, you send the, send the incremental from yesterday to today, uh, and then you delete yesterday's snapshot, but you retain today's snapshot until the next day comes around. So this previous snapshot always exists. Um, and it's always taking up space. And if you have some problem like uh, where the other system goes away for a little while and you can't do it every day, and then a month later you come back and you see, oh, there's still this snapshot here and it's retaining this space. Um, that's annoying. Uh, now with bookmarks, uh, after you do the ZFS send, um, you would create a bookmark for today's snapshot. Oh, and I completely typoed that. That should say, you would normally create the bookmark with the same name as the snapshot, so as to not confuse yourself. Um, so you normally, you would do like ZFS bookmark, pool FS at Tuesday, pound Tuesday, so the pound denotes that it's a, a bookmark. And then you can delete the Tuesday snapshot. And so during this time that you're waiting, you just have the bookmark and no extra snapshots. So Questions? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, so it, if both, it, if you modify the, the file system on the receiving side, then when you want to receive again on top of that, you have to make a choice of either not doing the receive or throwing away the changes that were made locally on the receiving system. So, So the, the bookmark is just on the sending side, and it's just about um, it's just about saving the space of that snapshot. So you don't have to keep you don't have to always keep that snapshot on the sending side, okay. whose purpose is just to you know know that this is the point in time that I have in common with the receiving side. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So like when you're doing the send here, you're still sending to a snapshot, because the snapshot is the thing that retains all the data. Yeah. And you can't, you can't create a snapshot from a bookmark. Of right. Data. Because the bookmark doesn't retain the data, so you can't get it back once you've already destroyed the data. Cool. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of features that are upcoming. Um, several of these are uh, out for code review. Um, we developed these at Delphix and we open sourced them uh, in March, um, but just kind of as part of our uh, GitHub repo. And we're working on upstreaming them now with several review requests out. So uh, the first one, I know this is a long awaited feature, uh, resum resumable send and receive. So the problem that this is addressing is um, if a receive fails, then we have to restart the whole process from the beginning. Um, so it could fail, like you have a network outage, the sending machine reboots, the receiving machine reboots. Um, but the, in any case, the end result is you lose all of the progress that you made. Um, so on the receiving system, we're just going to throw away any partially received state. And you have to redo the send and receive. And that's going to start from the beginning of that um, snapshot. So we saw this as a real customer problem because we uh, had one customer where it took them 10 days to do their send and receive. And uh, they had a network out, like the mean time between network failure was seven days. So this took a re uh, several tries before we were able to get like a 10 days between uh, network failure and actually the, what should have taken 10 days took like 40 days. So um, the solution uh, at a high level is pretty straightforward. When the receive fails, we keep that state instead of throwing it away. And we also remember um, what was the last received object and offset. So when we're doing the send, it's done uh, kind of all, all those records are in order, um, sorted by object and offset. So uh, just by remembering this is the last object and offset that we receive, uh, we know that we've got everything before that. We know that we're still waiting for everything after that. So we can just resume from that point in time. Um, so the sender needs to know to resume from that point in time. Um, and then it's able to seek directly to that object and offset. It doesn't have to like read everything before that and recreate it, anything like that. So how does this work? Um, send and receive is still unidirectional. So the sending sy system doesn't like ask the receiving system what it already has. Um, instead, uh, the system, system administrator or the application that's driving this um, is going to Look at this. Look for this new property on the receiving system. So when the receive fails, we automatically create this new property called the receive resume token, um, and that encodes the object and offset. Uh, so then that's fed into ZFS send. So here's an example of how you do this on the command line. Uh, so first, you do your ZFS send. You pipe it into ZFS receive, and you use, and you use this new dash s flag that indicates that you want to save the state if there's a failure. Then if it fails, uh, you use ZFS get to retrieve this uh, receive resume token property. And then uh, paste that into ZFS send dash T, paste that token, pipe ZFS receive. So the token tells it uh, all this stuff. It tells it um, where, what snapshot you're trying to send, what's the incremental source, where to resume from, as well as whatever features are enabled in the pool. So you don't have to do like dash I or t name your snapshots or anything. It's all encapsulated in that token. Um, the only real additional thing is uh, if 
you do this receive dash s and it saves the state. Uh, and then you realize, oh, like I can't actually ever receive this. Maybe the sending system just exploded in, in flames. Then um, you can do ZFS receive dash capital A to abort that like in progress um, receive. Uh, and it'll just throw away the data like it normally does um, if you don't specify dash s and, resume, and uh, re removes the, the token property. And there's equivalent API calls for all this in the libraries. Mm -hmm. So the, the disk space, um, it's tracked the same as when you're in the middle of a receive. So we kind of treat this when you have an a, um, interrupted s receive where you're saving the state. We treat it kind of the same semantically as though the receive was like still in progress and we're just still waiting for more data. Um, and uh, in terms of the space usage, uh, you'll see that the file system that you're receiving into, its space used uh, is more. And um, if you look at the detailed space usage uh, with the like used by uh, breakdown where it says used by snaps, used by children, used by data set, um, that space is gonna show up in the used by children. Uh, because under the hood, we're actually receiving it into, uh, like if you do receive into pool slash FS, we're actually Receive, putting the new data into this hidden file system that's pool slash fs slash percent receive. Um, that's a child of it. Uh, and then once it completes, then we move all the data around magically. Right. So then to find out what file systems have pending receives, you can just get that token. Yeah. If it doesn't exist, so then there, then there's a bunch of data that's hidden in that yeah. file system. That's right. And I don't, maybe, if you, I mean, this is like going under the hood a little bit. Like if you, it, it might work if you do is like ZFS list and then you know to type in the slash percent receive, um, but it might not, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, LibZFS is very high level, so you can almost think of um, most of the commands that you type on the command line using, you know, sbinzfs as just turning into one call into LibZFS. So you can think of something like ZFS create, where um, you're not just creating the files, it's not just creating the file system, it's also maybe mounting it, maybe sharing it, handling all the errors from all the different cases, printing out all the error messages, uh, most of that is all happening in libzfs versus libzfs core is much lower level. It's kind of like a thin wrapper around the ioctals to the kernel. So libzfs core is much, um, it's much easier to uh, understand the semantics from like a programming point of view in terms of like basically all the libzfs core calls are atomic. Um, they either succeed or fail and uh, they're kind of just doing one thing. So the error code that you get from it uh, you can actually understand in the context of that one thing that it's doing. Um, versus libzfs is like, oh, like I'm gonna do all these different things and if there's an error, I'll like spew something to standard out or standard error or whatever it does. Um, and uh, libzfs is kind of the older one and so libzfs core doesn't have all of the functionality that libzfs and the command line do. Um, but the intention is that libzfs core eventually becomes complete and also like a stable API versus libzfs is so like, people use it, treat it as a stable API, but it's not really and it's kind of like the, the, the program interface is kind of gross. So is the plan at some point that libzfs would then wrap around libzfs? Yeah, it, it, it does wrap around libzfs core for the functionality that's available in libzfs core. I mean, most, for the most part, functionality isn't moved out of libzfs into libzfs core. Um, it's more that libzfs core exposes the uh, interfaces that are, that are available from the kernel. And then libzfs, rather than like calling directly into the kernel, like 
doing IOCTLs to the kernel, it's calling into libzfs core, which is doing the IOCTLs for it. Just because libzfs core is, is such a thin yeah. kind of layer. Yes? So I'm assuming that if you do a VFS send with the, um, and you know, let's say it gets interrupted and it receives it, if you do another VFS send, then does it, it throws away the old copy, the, the, the yeah, if you don't if do you, don't if you don't do a resuming send, yeah. um, then it, it it'll throw away uh, what you've already got. Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to ask, why not have just the default of like three thousand lines that would be mm -hmm. automatically? Um, okay, so that's kind of two questions, right? One is why do you need the dash s, and the other is why do you need to pass the token rather than having them talk to each other, right? So I'll, I'll address the second one first. Um, we wanted. For simplicity, we wanted to keep the unidirectionality property. Um, uh, if, if we wanted the two machines to t be able to talk back and forth to each other, right? We, you need, they would need to talk, be able to talk back and forth for the sending to ask the receiving like, hey, how far have you gotten? Oh, this is how far I've gotten. Um, the interface of how you use this would change dramatically, right? Pipes are unidirectional um, and uh, so we wanted to make this easy to integrate into existing workflows. Um, uh, then to the question of why do we re require dash s rather than making that the default, um, it's kind of the same reason of like if, you've already if you already have an application that's built on top of send and receive um, and you do uh, receive, you expect that it's going to, like you expect that if it fails, the then the data is gone and it isn't wasting a bunch of space. If, if we made dash s the default, then you know, the receive would fail, it'd be wasting all the space, and then uh, obviously your application doesn't know about reasonable send and receive, so then it just goes and does the whole send again, and then like, blows away what's there, and you, you end up with this possibility of like, the application not realizing that, well, the application wouldn't realize that this extra space is being used, um, and then that potentially causing problems. So that's why you have to opt into this. Yeah. So like if, if the sending system is older than the receiving system and the receiving system defaulted to you know, saving the state, then it's like that's completely useless because there's no way that the sending system can resume because it has older version of ZFS. Yes? So with it being unidirectional, you just wouldn't need anything in the buffer and then twice and then the uh, Well, the sending, si the sending system isn't keeping track of what is sent. Right, it's only the receiving system that's keeping track. You need to pipe it to CFS receive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like if, if you're just sending into a file, then you can't res you can't resume that. Yeah. The ZFS get. This is on the target system. So on the target system, it has this receive resume token. Yes. Yeah. So like if you're a sysadmin, you're just like, you know, copy paste into the other SSH terminal. Um, if you're writing an application, then it's however your application is coordinating talking to these two systems to begin with. Yes. So I'm only asking this because it's his question. You could still, there's still, let's say you were like sending to a file and you realize that got interrupted. I still could um, send that file into ZFS receive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the token, and then have two really weird streams that I could then. Use. Yeah, you can totally do that. Um, that's like what we do for testing. Um, also, like in theory, like if somebody has a use case for this, you could totally write something that like uh, does, like if you do a send, you put it in a file, and then you hit Control C, and it's truncated. You could totally write a utility that like examines that file and generates the resume token that will allow it to be resumed. Um, without having to actually receive it. Like, that wouldn't be that hard. If somebody wants to implement it, uh, let me know. I can kind of show you where the code is that generates it, the resume token. Was there an, an, another hand? Yes. Next slide. <laughs> so uh, this is what the resume token looks like. This one dash E six O blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, 
if you do CFS send dash V, then it'll dump out the token. Um, literally, it's like uh, token version number dash checksum dash length dash uh, 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 hex encoded NV, uh, serialized NV list. And this is the decoded NV list. Um, so you see it has like the, the from GUID, the to GUID, um, the object and offset that we are resuming from, as well as uh, the number of bytes that the receiving system has already received, which is used to uh, estimate this uh, send size. So like on the sending system, it's going to estimate what if I was not doing a resume, how much sp space would that use, and then subtract out whatever the other system has already got. Um, so this is just another example showing um, if I do that ZFS send and I pipe it into zstream dump dash V, um, you know, it shows uh, we're going to resume from object 2134 at offset 655 kilobytes. And then the first object record that is going to be in the send stream is for 2134. And the first write record is going to be for uh, offset 655 kilobytes. Cool. Any, any more questions about this? Great. So. So as part of this um, resumable send and receive work, I realized that um, some other of the infrastructure inside send and receive wasn't quite sufficient. So previously, um, we had a checksum at the end of the stream. So the checksum is used uh, so that the receiving system can verify that the data that it's got um, wasn't, uh, was transmitted faithfully from the sending system to the receiving system. Um, I'm sure, as many of you know, uh, the checksum that's in TCP is ridiculously weak. Um, and uh, you know, if you put this on tape or whatever, then uh, that could also introduce errors. Um, so we have this additional level of, uh, uh, of reliability where we actually verify that it's the same data that was transmitted um, using this checksum. It's like a you know, ZFS style 128-bit, um, or sorry, 256-bit checksum. Um, so previously, the checksum was just at the end of the stream. So you could receive the whole thing, and then you get to the very end, and you're like, oh, somewhere in there, the, check, like, the checksum doesn't match. So sorry. Um, but if you interrupted the, the receive, then you wouldn't know if the data that you already got was correct or not. So uh, I modified this to add a checksum into every record. Um, so e each record is like uh, at most 128 kilobytes. Um, so after every rec or before we start using the metadata in a, in a record, then we verify the checksum to make sure that what we've got um, actually matches what the sending side intended to send us. Uh, and now, you know, when you're res when you're receiving, uh, if you get interrupted, then we know that the data that we've all got that we've already gotten, it all checks them correctly. Um, this change was made in a backwards compatible way. So these um, new checksum fields were added to, like, we found some padding that we could put them into. So you don't have to explicitly enable this on the sending side. Okay. It's just always enabled, and then older software just it will ignore it. And then this would also be probably trivial to, to pull into an external pool so that we could verify backups are showing this. Uh, ZStream dump does that. Yeah, so ZStream dump um, actually verifies the checksums as it's going, and it'll print out if something doesn't match. So when you see the ZStream inside, you would abort it in the way that it went forward. Yeah, exactly. The receiving side aborts as soon as there's an invalid checksum. Um, so it, it detects both invalid checksum as well as um, like a truncated stream. And um, there's actually tests in the test suite that, um, that do both of those things and, and make sure that that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, um, you know, if, if this checksum was bad, then it would have all of the data up to and including the previous record. And then when you resume, this would be the first record that it sent uh, on the sending system. Other questions? OK, cool. So um, getting back full circle to your question at the beginning of the talk about um, 
uh, about M buffer. Um, so uh, on the when you're receiving, um, we found that there was a problem with ZFS receive, where um, well, okay, where uh, we found there's a problem with ZFS receive, where uh, it you looked at the system and it seemed like it was just issuing one read at a time and uh, it wasn't really writing a lot of data. It was like every, day, every block that it wrote, it was having to read something and it was just doing one read at a time and performance was generally sucking. Um, so we took a look at this and we found that the problem was um, in how the receive uh, processes, processes those write records. Um, so the write, re the write record, when, when we do the process the write, we have to write some data into an object. Um, and that inherently requires that we read, at some point, read the indirect block that points to that data block. Because we're going to change the contents of the indirect block, but not all of the contents. We're just changing the pointer to the one block that we're modifying. Um, and the problem is that this read of the indirect block happens synchronously. So uh, when we're receiving, this is what the thread does. It first gets the record from the network. Um, then it issues the read I.O. for the indirect block. It waits for that, uh, for that read to complete. And then it does the write. And the write here is just copying the data into the DMU. It isn't actually doing any I.O. or waiting for any I.O. That, that all happens uh, when we do a TXG sync, which is like you know, millennia in the future, Billion, billions of nanoseconds in the future. Um, and then repeat. So the problem is, obviously, like we issue the read, we wait for the read. If, that, if this actually has to wait, because we didn't have it already cached, then uh, th we're going to be waiting for a long time there. So the solution that we implemented is we created a new worker thread. So the main thread is going to be getting the data from the network. And then the worker thread is going to be the one actually uh, doing the writes into the DMU. So the main thread is going to get the record from the network issue the read for the indirect block, but this is going to be a prefetch read. So it's not going to wait for that read to complete. And then it's going to enqueue this record in memory um, for processing by the worker thread. So you can see in the main thread here, there's no waiting for anything except for the network. Um, now in the worker thread, we dequeue the record, wait for the read of that indirect block to complete, which was already, the prefetch was already issued there. and then perform the write, i.e. copy the data into the DMU. Um, so because this queue uh, has like a size, it's not just one record, um, it, it buffers up uh, between these two threads. And uh, by the time the worker thread, after the, after the first time the worker thread waits, then um, the next time it, it, it gets to waiting, it, the prefetches would have already completed. So um, the end result here was, uh, on a synthetic benchmark, we got a 6x performance improvement on ZFS receive. Um, and then on actual customer data, um, uh, where they're doing an incremental send of a database, it went twice as fast. So this is a pretty huge improvement for us. Yes? So on the send side, you have better press uh, from the bytes match. Is there a similar tunable tuner? Yeah, there is. So there's a, a similar tunable, I forget exactly what the name of it is, um, that specifies how much memory can be used in this buffer. And the default for that is also 50 megabytes. Yeah. It depends on the size of uh, R to cache all these citations, right? Um, yeah. So the, they're going to be, um, they're going to be in arc buffers, but I'm not sure exactly how they will be visible in like the arc stats. Um, they, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? No, yeah, R can be disabled for this data set completely. So like, uh, oh, um, oh, yes. So the, the arc is not disabled. Um, the reads of the indirect blocks are going to go into the arc. So like the prefetch is doing an arc read. And then when we come down here and wait for the read of the indirect block to complete, what it's actually doing is it's doing an arc read and just relying on the fact that like we already issued that prefetch. Um, yeah, so that's totally like using the arc. Um, I was thinking of the, um, the queue of these records. Um, that data 
it has the data that we are going to write but haven't written yet. And um, that is not in the arc yet because it, we haven't done the write yet. Um, so that's the stuff that I was thinking of, like where we're just allocating an arc buff and then putting the data in. And then later on when we do this write, we put the arc buff, buff back into the DMU. Because um, the, the, the tunable of how much data, it really is controlling like how much data is going to be done in these writes because that's the dominating factor um, rather than the, those few indirect blocks. Cool. Um, so that's all that I have on ZFS send and receive. Um, oh, we're perfect on time. So we covered uh, why you'd want to use this, uh, why it's better than other tools, um, how it works, and uh, a bunch of new features here. Um, the last thing I wanted to, or second to last thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, we're going to be having the third annual OpenZFS Developer Summit um, this year uh, at the end of October, October 12th, uh, 19th, and 20th. Um, this is the third annual as well as the 10th anniversary of the open sourcing of uh, ZFS. Uh, it's going to be down in, thank you. It's going to be in uh, downtown San Francisco again. Um, again, we're going to have uh, one day of talks, uh, one day hackathon. Uh, the main, I know this is pretty far in advance, so the main thing that um, I'm looking for from you guys is uh, talk proposals. Um, we're looking for talks about uh, you know, features that you've implemented in ZFS, ideas that you have, um, as well as you know, maybe how you're using ZFS uh, at your company. Um, there's also a few sponsorship opportunities remaining, so if, if you or your uh, company are interested in sponsoring, <clears throat> um, that, that's still available. Um, and uh, new this year, we're going to have a small registration fee for attending. Um, and the, the registration fee is, of course, waived for uh, speakers and sponsors. So that's all I have. Um, there's going to be a uh, OpenZFS BOF uh, in this room immediately following this. So uh, go grab lunch and come back. Um, and there's also going to be uh, another great talk later today uh, by Kirk McCusick about um, ZFS internals that it'll be covering kind of other stuff besides send and receive. So you might want to check that out as well. Thanks. <laughs>